get the title, you may wonder, so what is so different among South Asians? Yes, indeed, South Asians are different, particularly Indians. And you may call India as an ethnic museum because it has a collection of large number of population groups. Some group look like Europeans, some group look like Southeast Asian, some group doesn't look like anybody, they are unique to India. And some of you may surprise to know that in India we have 4,635 anthropologically well-defined population groups. Nowhere in the world we have such a huge diversity that includes tribes, primitive tribes, and some of them still practice hunters and gatherers lifestyle. So another interesting aspect of India is that uh, the first out of Africa human migrated out of Africa and reached Andaman and Nicobar Islands about 65,000 years back. As you see here, some group I forgot to mention, they typically look like African, but they diverged about 65,000 years back. So subsequently what we did, we have analyzed large number of populations using Affymetrix array. And as you see here, these are Indian groups. This is a European app map sample, African app map sample, and Chinese app map sample. So this slide alone tells that how diverse the Indian populations are. As you see, these three heart map groups clusters, suggesting that they are more homogeneous compared to Indians. Whereas Indians, every group is very unique. However, there's still there is some kind of genetic affinities between the groups. So what we propose by looking at this population is that in the prehistoric India, there were two founding populations. One we call them as ancestral South Indians, who are part of the early modern human migration. That means while Andamanis were migrating towards uh, Andaman, taking southern coastal routes, some group is settled in southern part of India, whom, call, whom we call it as ancestral South India. Then the second wave brought people from Africa and there was some kind of divergence. Uh, one group has gone to Europe and the other group has gone, uh, came down to India, northern part of India, whom we call as ancestral North Indians. And these two groups have admixed some time ago and gave rise to many population groups. And we are not sure that when this admixture took place. Our subsequent study, looking at large number of population groups again, suggested that uh, these two founding groups have gave rise to many population groups, both ASI and ANI. And these two groups have admixed during the last 4,000 to 2,000 years, as it indicated here. And after that, that means for the last 2,000 years, every single population started maintaining the endogamy. So that was the reason in the PCA plot, what you see, every group is very unique, but because of the admixture, so they show some kind of genetic affinities. But now our interest was to see what is the impact of following endogamy marriage practice for the last 2000 years. So now we took again large number of samples. Now we thought it would be a good idea to extend beyond 
India. So we went on to countries like uh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, taking about 2,800 samples and start looking at is there some uniqueness emerging from uh, the endogamy marriage practice. So the reason why we took the entire South Asia or representative samples from South Asia is that there are two reasons. One is when we looked at earlier South Asians and genetically to say simply there are two components in the structure analysis within South Asia. One is a dark green color which is restricted only among South Asians. So other one is going beyond South Asia, Caucasus, Middle East and so on. And when we looked at only the South Asian component, about 50% of the South Asian component actually has gone from India. That means that India has contributed about 50% of the human population to other South Asian countries. The second one is when we found a mutation that's a 25, 25 base per deletion in myosin binding protein C3 gene, which leads to sudden cardiac arrest. If it is the homozygous condition, the individual die at very early age, less than 10 years, which we found by looking at the postmortem tissue of the children who died at very early age. But when it is in the heterozygous condition, the individual live up to 40 or 45 years without any phenotypic uh, effect. After that, it shows the phenotypic effect and the individual die at, uh, while walking or playing and so on. When we tried to look for that mutation, when we screened among Indians, and we found its existence at 4%. Then we thought it would be a good idea to screen population around the world. We screened population from 26 countries, amounting a total of 8,000 plus samples. And to our surprise, we found that mutation existing only in South Asia, but not in other countries. So that was the reason we took samples from other South Asian population as well. Therefore, we thought that whatever we find in India is also true for other South Asian countries. When we analyzed and found that large number of populations, 81 out of 263 population which we analyzed showing high IBD score. So those populations, some of the populations, as you see here, so this is Ashkenazi Jewish population and Finnish population who are known to have high frequency of recessive disease, as much smaller IBD score compared to large number of Indian or South Asian groups, several fold, suggesting that although the samples are normal, collected for different purpose, and when we looked at the high IBD or foundry event is, is very, very predominant among them, suggesting that a large number of population groups in India is going to have recessive disease. So that's to give those who are non genericists This pedigree shows for example, this is a chromosomal fragment which has, for example, mutation in one of the chromosomes, heterozygous. The individual is all right. But when we go generation after generation in heterozygous condition, so everybody is going to be normal. And on the other side, it goes again in heterozygous condition. The individuals are perfectly normal. And after several generations, if these two individuals who carry the heterozygous mutation, when they marry, that's when there's a problem. That we also found in a disease caused by 
poly G, that's a polymerase gamma 1, which is essential for mitochondrial DNA replication. And there are, this, there are two families, one family is with consanguineous marriage, where you see both the parents are heterozygous for this mutation. But when we pass that to the next generation, there are two homozygous individuals. One individual died at the age of 13. At the time of analysis, he was all right, but by the time we complete the analysis, there is no more. But we don't know the fate of this girl again who has a homozygous mutation. On the other hand, if you look at the pedigree, which is non consanguineous, again, what you see is the two heterozygous parents, and unfortunately, so both the children have homozygous mutation and both have died. So, having this information, we propose as a broader sense that since we are finding large number of populations are with high IBD score and high boundary event, there is a possibility that one can map the genes which are responsible for large number of recessive disease. Of course, to make it more simple, I put on a picture on the cover which explains there are two information that is in India or South Asia, people live in a group that is a endogamy practice which is not the case in most of the countries. And while practicing the endogamy, as I mentioned earlier, there is a possibility of two unrelated individuals today, but they must have originated from a common ancestor who carry the mutation. If they marry two heterozygous individuals, that is when they give rise to homozygous mutation and the person with homozygous mutations are going to have a disease. And to our experience, what I showed in the earlier pedigree, the individuals are dying at very early age. Right? So what my prediction is that, so most of the disease are not even come to the attention of the medical community because most of them, the population which we have analyzed are in the rural area and the children are dying at very early age. I don't know how many such cases are existing. So in order to analyze and take it forward to help the population, we need to have something like what the Ashkenazi Jewish population practice. They have an organization called Dor Eshom, where the community, that's a community-based uh, medical testing uh, organization, where they go to school, collect the sample from the school, children, the sequence and put the sequence in the database. When they grow and uh, ready to marry, that's when they compare the sequence of two individuals who are ready to marry. They, and if they find that the same mutation which causes a recessive disease is existing in both the individual and they advise accordingly. So that is very, very essential to practice in India. So to do that, there are many, many more groups have to be involved, groups with the different expertise, and particularly in the context of cell biology. So we need cell biologists not only to understand the pathophysiologists, but also to screen drug molecules for identifying the drugs, which may help in curing the disease. Of course, we just initiated some work with uh, Josna and uh, Chan Shekhar. On the other hand, just want to show that this is a different project altogether, just how we have just gone to cell biology with Anuranya Anand from JNC. The mutation which found to be associated with infertility, particularly azospermia, sent in one, and tried to see the function of that, and found that uh, there's a 
multipolar cell and anaphase bridging. Therefore, this meiotic caress which leads to azoospermia. When Jay, who gave a talk in the morning, visited a couple of months ago and, uh, and we are discussing, he was so excited to look for the same in the fly model. So that's how the collaboration come to kind of shaping up and it's exciting time that we have expertise in different field. If we all put together, definitely we'll have a fruitful results. Apart from the biologists or clinicians, so I also interact with or collaborate with non-scientists, including the archaeologists, anthropologists, linguists, and sometimes historian for my the first part of the work which I presented. So for the young colleagues and the students, the collaboration is very, very important. And this is just to show that how the collaboration can lead to some kind of interesting finding. So with that, I just acknowledge the colleagues, particularly uh, Dr. Lalji Singh, who unfortunately passed away recently, and large number of my colleagues from CCMB, and the other side, David, with whom again we have large collaborative projects. And the list goes, as I mentioned, goes, goes. And, uh, the funding has come from CSIR, ICMR, and UKRI. Thank you very much.